With that said, we're going to be looking today at verses 13 through 18 in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Let me read to you from those verses. I'll introduce the study and move into it. Paul writes, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And so as we enter our study, let me develop it. I'm going to give you a lot of foundation today in order for us to understand what Paul would be speaking about. We, don't, we need to know that this portion is intended to give hope to the Christians, Christians who are going through difficult times, hard times. <clears throat> I'll develop that for just a moment here. The church has been going through persecution for their faith in Jesus Christ, and Paul has been mentioning that to us in the letter. <clears throat> All the way back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, in verse 6, he had said to them, you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. In chapter 2, verse 14, he had said, Your, For you, brethren, became imitators of, the, uh, imitators of the church of God, which are in Judea in Christ Jesus. You also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans. And then in chapter 3, verse 3, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we're appointed to this. So he's speaking of persecution, affliction, suffering, and uh, he's concerned. He's concerned, as we've already seen, that they would hold fast onto their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He was concerned, and he said this in chapter 3, verse 5, that his labor among them might not be in vain. So Paul is concerned that they hold fast. With this in mind, he brings hope and comfort to their troubled heart. He, des he desires them to live in hope and in faith <laughs> in spite of how it may be appearing at that time. Now, why would he be concerned for them? What, what would it be that's motivating him? Well, we need to remember that when Jesus was giving his teachings, he gave us various parables. And one of the parables that Jesus gave is a, a parable concerning the sower and the seed. And if you remember that, it's found in, uh, as I'm, I'll quote it, it's found in, in Matthew 13. Uh, he gave a parable of so the sower and the seed, and he spoke of four types of ground that the seed would be sown upon. <clears throat> now, one of the types of soils that he spoke about was called stony places. And he said that the seed would sprout quickly because the ground, he said, was shallow. And when the sun rose, the seed would be scorched, having no root, it would wither away. Now, as men had asked him, what is the meaning of this particular parable? And he explained it. Now, in reference to the seed on stony places, this is what he said, Matthew 13, 20 and 21. He who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. The Thessalonians are undergoing affliction. Paul is concerned for them. Under persecution and affliction, it's easy to begin to lose hope. If you're going through hard times, you, you can become uh, curious. You, you can even wonder why, why we, who are trying so hard, are going through so many hard times. I thought that when I gave my heart to Christ, everything would be easy from now on. The road to hell you know, is it can be, sometimes it can be, we can struggle, we can hurt, we can have no hope, etc. But now that I'm saved, I thought I'd have joy all the time. And, and then I began to go through things because of my faith. 
Peter spoke about this in 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13 when he said it like this. He said, Beloved, don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Don't think it's strange. We're going to be looking at this 1 Peter 4 passage this upcoming Wednesday. And he speaks concerning that. Paul is comforting and encouraging them. And he's saying to them, you need to hold fast to the Lord. You need to abide in the Lord. You need to remain firm in his love. You need to trust him. It, like it says in Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised, he says, is faithful. So part, part of what has been troubling them is related to questions about their future. Now remember, this is a relatively young church, but this church has been well taught. They had received teachings on things that are related to what we today refer to as end times. And so they'd received teachings on those things. And, and again, Paul has already made mention of the coming of the Lord in this letter. In chapter 1, verse 10, he said they were waiting for God's Son from heaven. <clears throat> in chapter 2, verse 19, he spoke of being in the presence of Jesus at his coming. In chapter 3, verse 13, he spoke of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. In chapter 5, we're going to see that he's going to refer to the day of the Lord. And we'll see when we get there next week, we're going to see that the day of the Lord is speaking of judgment upon the ungodly. So they're well taught. But there were details that had caused them concern. Here's the problem. They thought they had missed the rapture because they're going through affliction. They didn't expect persecution, so they're beginning to think they may be in the tribulation. Remember in chapter 3, uh, verses 2 and 3, Paul had said that he had sent Timothy to encourage them that they might not be shaken, he said, by their afflictions. Now, on top of this, and I'm again laying a foundation for you, on top of this, 2 Thessalonians will reveal that false teachers are adding to their anxieties. They're telling them that they're in the tribulation. So Paul wrote his second letter, and he referred to what, would, what had been happening in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 and 2. He said, Brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. So they're confused because they expect the rapture, and they expected the rapture to occur before this affliction and tribulation, and they're going through some severely hard times. Now, if the rapture that they were expecting, and I'll give you more about that in a moment, if the rapture was after the tribulation, they wouldn't have been this concerned. But they are concerned. And so what we're going to be looking at in this portion of Scripture is something that is referred to, we use the word, the rapture. Now, I want to develop that with you, too, a little bit further. The return of the Lord Jesus Christ has two basic elements. It's the rapture, the second coming. Now, in the rapture, Jesus comes for his church, and he meets us in the air. Notice it says it in verse 17, We who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so, in the rapture, Jesus comes for his church and meets us in the air. At what is referred to as the second coming, there are various portions of Scripture that speak concerning that, and, and says that Jesus will actually come to earth. Jesus' feet, according to Zechariah 14.4, will touch the Mount of Olives. It says in Zechariah 14.4, on that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley with half of the Mount moving north and half moving south. In the rapture, believers meet the Lord in the air and go with him to heaven. In the second coming, believers return with the Lord during the battle of Armageddon. Revelation 19, 14 says, The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean. The rapture will happen before the tribulation. It's referred to in Revelation 6, verse 16 as the wrath of the Lamb. 
The rapture is when believers are saved from the hour of wrath. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9, God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. In Revelation 3, 10, since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is, coming, uh, that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. The second coming is when the Lord brings wrath and judgment on the earth. Jude 14 and 15 says that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all of them of, the, of all the ungodly acts they have committed in their ungodliness and of all the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. At his second coming, Jesus will be defeating the armies of Antichrist again in Armageddon. Now, the rapture can happen at any moment. It can happen at any time. We don't know the time. But the second coming occurs after certain events transpire. All you need to do is read Matthew chapters 24 and 25 and Revelation chapters 6 through 19. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 4, Paul said that the Antichrist will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. So certain events have to transpire. So the believers are confused by various teachers who have entered in. They're beginning to think we must have missed the rapture. They're confused about what's happening. They're beginning to have questions, and Paul is about to answer those questions. And so they have questions. Did we miss the rapture? And on top of this, there's something else that's bothering them, and you'll see that in this passage. They're concerned about their believing loved ones who have already died, and that's giving them even more questions. They're wondering, well, what happens to those who died before, before the Lord comes for us? When do believers receive their resurrection bodies? Do they receive them at the rapture? Do they receive them after tribulation? Is a rapture for those who are alive at that time? Well, what happens to the dead in Christ? So his desire is to answer their questions and to comfort them and to give them hope. He's concerned that they not sorrow as those who have no hope for the future. So, instead of directing their attention to their troubles, he directs them to their future, and he speaks concerning Jesus coming for the church in the rapture. Now, I'll develop it another step, and eventually we'll get into the passage. The return of the Lord is referred to throughout the New Testament. In the 260 chapters of the New Testament, his return is mentioned 318 times. So as Christians, the anticipation of being with the Lord is what fuels our lives. It's one of the promises that motivates us to be prepared. The return of the Lord is intended to make us prepared for Christ to live for Jesus. Now, often in Scripture, his return is presented as something that will occur soon. In Philippians 4, verse 5, Paul said, Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord, he said, is near. 1 Peter 4, 7, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. James chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. You too be patient. Stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you'll be judged. The judge is standing at the door. So that's written to provoke us to have anticipation, to have, us have a, a, a hopeful sense. And, and it causes me to be prepared. It causes me to live as if he's coming today. We need to be ready. In Romans 13, 12 and 13, the night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. Don't live in darkness. Get rid of your evil deeds. Shed them like dirty clothes. Clothe yourselves in the armor of right living as those who live in the light. We should be decent and true in everything we do so that everyone can approve of our behavior. Don't participate in wild parties and getting drunk or in adultery, and immoral living, or in fighting, and jealousy. In Titus 2, 11 through 13, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly 
in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in 1 John 3, 2 and 3, Beloved, now we are children of God. It has not yet uh, been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he's revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So, Jesus promised that he would return for us. I've done a few funerals in my ministry life. I've done bedside ministry to those who are about to enter into, into heaven. And this is what I've done. I've done this, I did this with my father, did it with my uncle, I've done it with members of our fellowship. It's always pretty much the same because they're all about to enter. And I'll always quote John 14. I always do. It's a promise Jesus gave. Jesus said it. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. It's a promise that the Lord gives to us. If it were not so, I would have told you. I said that to my dad as he was there in his, in his coma before he went home. I said it to my, to my uncle. I've said it to people. That is a hope that Jesus gives to us. I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you into myself. And that's something that we ought to remember. And that's something that ought to give us hope. When Jesus ascended in Acts chapter 1, two angels spoke to his apostles who were watching him as he ascended. And it says in Acts 1, 9 through 11, uh, after Jesus had spoken, he was taken up before their very eyes. A cloud hid him from their sight. And they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So Jesus promised he'd return. And these believers are, are aware of that promise, but he hasn't returned. And their believing friends and their relatives are dying. They're going through affliction and persecution, and they're beginning to lose heart. Along with the persecution and affliction, there's the grief and the sorrow over the deaths of their friends and family members. And Paul wants them to be free. Paul wants them to be free from the sorrow that is so often associated with death. And and so he does this by reminding them of God's promises. And he answers their questions, and, and he brings them comfort, and he gives them hope for the future. Again, many of the Thessalonians had become concerned about their relatives. What's going to happen when the Lord returns? Are they going to be left there in the graves? Are they going to be with him? What is going to happen to them? And that's why verse 13, that was your introduction. Let's get in the study. I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. I do not want you to be ignorant. The word ignorant is a word that we use today. People can be insulted by it. I remember many years ago now, I was speaking to a friend of mine, and I said, well, that's because they're ignorant. Oh, they got really angry at me. Like, how dare you call somebody ignorant? And I said, well, don't be so ignorant. No, I said, <laughs> I said, do you know what ignorant means? You know, I didn't say it quite like that. That sounds a bit arrogant. I said, well, you know, what, you know what ignorant means, don't you? Well, what's it mean? It means literally without knowledge. That's what it means. It's not a slam. It's not a slur. It's not a put down. It's simply a word that describes that we haven't been instructed in something. So Paul isn't saying, I don't want you guys to be ignorant morons and putting them down. What he's saying is, I don't want you to be without instruction. 
I don't want you to be without knowledge concerning these things because so very often when we don't have the knowledge, that's when we have the problem. If, if you instruct me, if you, if you tell me, if you share with me, if you help me to understand, then I'm going, I'll be okay. But it's when I'm without knowledge, it's when I'm wondering, it's when I'm doubting, it's when I have questions, it's, it's, it's when all of those things are, are compiling to cause me to be a bit anxious because I don't know what's going on. Well, there's, there's the rub, there's the problem. So he says, I don't want you to be without knowledge. I don't want you uninstructed concerning these things. I want to free you from the sorrow that is so very often associated with the grieving at the loss of somebody that you love. Now, what is it? What is it in this particular context? What is it that will give them hope? Well, he points them to the Lord Jesus and how he's coming for them. He says, I don't want you to have sorrow in the manner of those. Notice, manner of those who have no hope. Now, this is not saying that sorrow is something that Christians don't experience. He's not saying that sorrow is wrong. Sorrow is normal in times of loss and grief. It's part of mourning. I, I, I have to be real with you in this. I, you know, I've been a Christian a long time, and and the first time I ever experienced a, a true depth of grief, I experienced, obviously we all experience grief, but the first time I experienced a real deep grief, that's when my father went home in a surprising way. I did not expect my dad to die. My dad was 74 years old. And so I thought we had time. I thought we had time. We didn't. And it surprised me. And it was so sudden. It was like he had a heart attack and three days later, he, or so he's dead, right? And so it's like, how do you prepare for something like that? And I know how you're supposed to, but when it hit me in my face the way it did and the grief was so overwhelming, I, sor I sorrowed for a long time. And so much so that that it disturbed members 20 plus years ago who were in the church. And some of them apparently believed that I had no faith because I grieved so deeply, which I learned some lessons. I learned some lessons about grief and who to trust with your heart. I learned some lessons about that. And I felt these things. I'm very real and very open. Those of you who come to this church pretty much know that. But I had to learn to be more guarded because some people just don't understand. They just don't. And it's, that's just okay. That's okay. It's just you have to learn that, well, he, he said, I don't want you to sorrow as those who have no hope. He's not saying, I don't want you to sorrow. He's saying, I don't want you to sorrow as if you're hopeless. That's not the case. You see, I believe, and I've grown to believe this, that that sorrow is one of those things that reveals the depth of our emotions and attachments. And when it comes to relationships, because Christians have been taught to love deeply, listen carefully, some of you may want to hear this, others, perhaps one day you'll remember this. Because we've been taught to love deeply, we also grieve deeply. And I believe that, sor that Christians sorrow deeper than those who have no relationship with God. And you know why? Because we love deeper. And when you love deeply, you sorrow deeply. And there's nothing wrong with it as long as you're not sorrowing in a way that shows you have no hope. And that's what Paul is talking about. I would not have you sorrow as those who have no hope. He's not saying don't sorrow. There's a time for grief. There's a time for mourning. There's a time for joy, and there's a time for tears. And so he's saying, I don't want you to be hopeless as if it's all gone, as if it's all over. You see, the difference is our sorrow isn't fueled by hopeless despair about the future. Of all people, we believers in Christ have a hope. We have a hope for the future, and he's, he's presenting to us this picture of hope. And so he says, I wouldn't have you sorrow in verse 13, lest you sorrow, uh, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For, 
Verse 14, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, well, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. We have hope for the future because we believe that Jesus died, but he rose again. Jesus conquered the grave, and in doing so, he gives us hope for eternity. The grave couldn't hold him, and the grave will not hold us either. In Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, the children have flesh and blood. He too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. You see, that's the one thing that we saw recently. A lot of people revealed their fear of death. This whole nation revealed their fear of death. You still see people driving by themselves wearing masks. And it revealed, this is no mockery of them, it's just true. It revealed their fear of death. To be wearing double masks and triple masks and the whole nine yards. And so that just revealed that to us. That gave to us who, who know the Lord more insight into that which has held them captive. So in conquering the grave, he's given us hope. And it also gives us hope for those who have died in faith that we love. And he gave, he gave us hope because we know that this life isn't all there is. And he conquered the grave which gives us confidence for our own personal future. But they're wondering, what about those, verse 14, who fell asleep before Jesus takes us? Well, he says, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So he's speaking about this church service. Wake up. No. <laughs> he's speaking of Christians who have died. Paul is not saying that their souls are asleep, by the way. In John 11, verses 11 through 14, our friend Lazarus sleeps, is what he said, but I go that I may wake him up. His disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest in sleep. So Jesus, then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Now, I'm going to make a very brief point. There are those who believe in something called the doctrine of soul sleep. That they're in, in death, your soul is, is, is asleep. But Jesus didn't use the word sleep as if that was a reality. As a matter of fact, he's not saying, and, and the, the scripture is not saying that their souls are asleep. He's saying these have died in faith. And this is what he's referring to. At death, the spirit will leave the body. James 2.26 says the body without the spirit is dead, but that results in the body itself appearing to be sleeping. That's what it's referring to, those who sleep. Again, those of you who have gone, and I'm assuming all of us have been in a funeral, and you see the body of the one who has, has passed on, and it looks like he's asleep, and that's the point. The body appears to be sleeping, and Jesus is speaking about that, and Paul was speaking about that. But what is happening what, what happens when a, a believer dies? Well, the spirit goes to be with the Lord. The body appears to be asleep. Ecclesiastes 12, 7 says, The dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. In 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, it says, So we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, while well, pleased, rather, to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. And that's why people have said so many times, you may hear that so-and-so died, but at that moment they, more, they are more alive than they've ever been. Their body may look like it's asleep, but they're with the Lord, present with the Lord. So the person dies, then their body, like a seed, is planted in the ground. In John 12, 24, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. If it dies, it produces much grain. So it's like a seed that is buried in the ground. And then finally, at the rapture, we who are alive and the dead in Christ 
will receive glorified bodies. In 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 44, so will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable, but it is raised imperishable. It's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It's sown in natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body. There's also a spiritual body. It'll be what is also referred to as a glorified body. So, giving you all of that, what about those who have died and gone on to be with the Lord? Again, he says in verse 14, we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. God will bring all believers. He's going to bring those who have died in Christ with him, but he's going to take us to be with him, and he's going to take us back to heaven. In Philippians 3, 20 and 21, it says, Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus, who will transform our lowly bodies, that it may be conformed to its glorious body, according to the working by which he's able even to subdue all things to himself. So this body that you're constantly, that we're constantly starving, and then painting, and doing all the other stuff to make it appear better than it is, there's these commercials. I was telling Marie this yesterday. There's this guy who's, who's selling some stuff. It's now, now men are starting to put this, this cream on their face to make them look younger. And this guy's saying, you know, you, you're going to look younger. You, not every man should do this, but those who do are going to look younger. And I turned to Marie, and I said, yeah, but my body's still old. I, I may look younger, but my body's saying you're dying. I mean, that's just a fact, Right? trying to appear and actually be. Those are two different things. God is going to be transforming this body into a glorious one. And that's what he's saying in verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. With the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. Now, I have to develop that a little bit more. I want you to see something in verse 15. It'll make some sense once I, once I present this to you. I want you to see again. This we say to you by the word of the Lord. What do, you, what do you mean by that? Well, Paul is saying, I'm writing to you in divine revelation. I'm showing you something that has been up to this point a mystery, but it's now being revealed. I'm showing you something. And it's something re related to, to when this all occurs. I I'm giving you insight into what's going to happen at that time. This is something that God has revealed to me that I'm revealing to you, Paul is saying. And so as he's saying that, he says, I say uh, this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. We. Notice how Paul includes himself in that event. He's simply telling us he expected to be with the Lord. And he's telling us that it's soon. And it appears very clear here, at least, that he expected this to occur in his lifetime. There are those, and I'll say this quickly, there are those that I have over the years, I have heard them, I've heard them either say it or they've written it, and they've said that Pastor Chuck Smith was a date setter. Some of you perhaps heard that. He was my pastor. Pastor Chuck was not a date setter. What Pastor Chuck was was a man who lived in anticipation of the Lord returning in his lifetime. And Paul did too. And we ought to also. The Lord is going to return. Why not today? The only thing that is lacking now in the prophetic calendar of God, the only thing that has yet to be fulfilled because everything else has been, the next thing in the prophetic calendar to occur is the rapture of the church. It's the taking of the church to be with Christ. That's the next thing on the prophetic calendar. And because that's what the scripture seems to be teaching, and I think fairly clearly, then how then should we live? How should we be as, as believers? Do we really believe that? Do we anticipate his return? Am I living as if he's even at the door? Am I living as if he's going to take me? And that's all the pastor ever taught us. He said, be ready. 
Because His coming could be in the morning, in, at noon, at, at evening. It could be at any time. So be ready at all times. And Paul is saying, we who are alive, including himself in that, we who are alive, but he's mentioning those who are alive as well as those who have died. And he says in verse 15, will by no means precede those who are asleep. So it's comforting them because he's saying that the dead in Christ participate in the rapture. Verse 16, the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. So the Lord himself is Jesus. Jesus is gathering his church. And another point that I need to make here, I want you to see the Lord himself speaks of Jesus gathering his church. It's not the angels who are gathering the church. That's another difference between the rapture and the second coming. At the rapture, Jesus comes for his bride and he takes us personally. At the second coming, Jesus said the angels are the reapers who gather tares at the end of the age. He said the harvest is at the end of the age. In Matthew 13, 41 and 42, the Son of Man will send out his angels. They will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The rapture is coming for the bride. That comes before tribulation. The Lord himself, verse 16, will descend with a shout. The word descend, it speaks of where he's been since his ascension. With a shout. That's a signal given to soldiers by a commander. It's a summons. It's a trumpet call. The voice of the archangel. Uh, there's, there's only one uh, angel in Scripture that is mentioned as an archangel, and that's Michael. In, in Jude 9, it says, even the archangel Michael. So these are all things that are related. A trumpet. Trumpets were used in Israel to gather a congregation. You see that in Numbers chapter 10. So there's a shout. There's a voice. There's a trumpet. All of this is speaking of an immediate departure. The dead in Christ, verse 16, rise first. Redemption for them is yet to be complete. The dead in Christ, their bodies have to be raised. In Romans 8, 23, it says, Not only they, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. So the body is going to be taken and transformed and their glorified bodies are joined with their glorified spirits and at that time they're fully conformed to the image of Christ. Then verse 17, we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. Caught up. There are those who, who believe that the rapture occurs at different times. They, some will teach that it happens during the middle of the trib, tribulation. As will say it happens at the end of the tribulation, the seven-year period where the wrath of the Lamb is poured out upon unbelievers and Christ rejectors. And they say, well, the word rapture is not found in the Scriptures. You never find the word rapture. Well, let me give you a little bit here. When it says caught up, that word caught up is a Greek word. The caught up word is in, in Greek is harpazo. The word harpazo means to violently take. To violently take. So the New Testament was written in, in Greek. So when it says we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together, the word caught up is the word harpazo. So where did we get the word rapture from? We get that from the Latin. When the New Testament was translated in, rap, in, in Latin, the rapture, the word caught up, is a Latin word, raptura. And it means the same thing. It means to carry away or to seize. And so the reason that we use the word rapture is because the word rapture is... Uh, from the Latin and not the Greek. But it speaks of being taken. And this is one of those things that is going to happen in any moment. Jesus gives so many different 
exhortations for the church to be ready. And he speaks in different ways, but it's always related to being prepared. Not getting caught up with the things of the world and then being distracted and beginning to pursue those things. There are those who hear the word of God and receive it with joy, but when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, they fall away. Why is that? Because they never really were saved. A lot of times people will answer an invitation. You give an invitation and people will come up and sometimes they're crying. And people will clap as we ought to and we're all blessed and all because we want to see that they're, these are people that seem to be entering in. But it's not the coming forward, it's the going forward that matters. And I think we make a big mistake when we put a lot of emphasis on someone coming forward. I think it's a good thing and I give invitations on occasion as the Spirit leads and and I think it's a good thing to do, and I have nothing against doing that. But I also know that a lot of times when people are coming forward, it's not because they're getting saved. We've been involved in different crusade follow-up ministries, and we've discovered that even when we've helped people in evangelism and crusade ministry and doing follow-up, that over 90% of the people that we've called up and said to them, we're following up because you came forward in this particular event. And over 90% will tell us, I was just rededicating myself. No, I'm already a Christian. I have a church I go to. 90% over. And so sometimes people get caught, wow, look at that, all these people. And me, I always rejoice because if one person comes with true faith in Christ, I'm blessed about that. We ought to be. But I'm also aware of the fact that people come forward for a variety of reasons, for a variety of reasons. And so it's not the coming for, it's the going for it. It's, it's, the, it's the remaining and it's the abiding and it's the growing in faith and, and it's the things like that. And, and, and that's what ought to cause us to be uh, blessed and all. And that's what ought to cause us to, to encourage people to come in faith in Christ. But a lot of people start out well, but they don't finish well. One of the most famous people you find in Scripture who does that is a man by the name of Demas. You see, Demas, on a couple of occasions in the writings of the New Testament, Demas, a man who was a traveling companion with the Apostle Paul, a man who, who knew him well, traveled with him, saw the world with him, evangelized with him. But the last time you see his name, the last time you see him mentioned in Scripture is found in the last epistle Paul ever wrote. It's called 2 Second, Second Timothy. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul makes it clear, Demas has forsaken me having loved this present age. And so this is a person who traveled along with, with Paul, went out and did ministry alongside of Paul, was somebody who was mentioned in Scripture more than once, and yet at the end, the last time you hear anything about Demas is he forsook and moved on. So the exhortation is to abide. The exhortation is to remain steadfast. The exhortation is to be firm in your faith because it's not just the, tr the crying. It's not just the coming forward. It's not just the falling down on your face. Some people do that. It's a going forward afterwards. And that's what Christianity is. It's, it's holding on to the end. And that's what Paul is saying. Don't be sorrowing as those who have no hope. Those who have gone before us, your family, your friends who have died and you're wondering what happened, they're going to meet us in the air. So you be prepared because the Lord is coming at any moment. There's going to be a shout, a voice of command, a trumpet. It's time to go. And we're going to be gone. And all the garbage that we worry about, all the things that preoccupy our minds, all the things that we plan to do when we, all of that's gone. And that's why we have to live on, uh, uh, in a constant expectation that today's the day the Lord has made. I'm going to be glad. I'm going to rejoice in it. I'm going to serve him today. That doesn't mean I don't make plans. It doesn't mean that I don't want to do certain things. But come quickly, Lord Jesus. Take us to be with you. I want to be with you. And that, that's the bottom line. We need to understand that today. We really do. Oh, the Lord is delaying his coming. He hasn't come yet. I might as well. Or maybe I'm supposed to be doing these things. No. We're to occupy until he comes. We're to be busy about our, our master's business. We're supposed to be living as if he's coming today. And if he doesn't come today, then maybe he'll come tomorrow. And if he doesn't come, and listen, I've been living like that now for 53 years. 
I was taught when I first got saved this doctrine of the rapture. I was taught that he'll be here at any moment. And I had friends that I, that I was developing fellowship with who, who had the same mentality. And they, and they infected me with it. But as I have waited, I have seen there's work to be done. If the Lord would have come the day after I got saved, my parents would have gone to hell. If the Lord would have come a year after I got saved, I'd have never met a girl named Marie, married her, and have children. So I am grateful for every day God gives me to live for him one more day and to share with others one more time about the love of Christ and how Jesus can save you and how he can transform you and that one day there'll be a shout. Perhaps the bridegroom comes or come up here and, and we're gone. And all the garbage that we were worried about, all the things that we were so, oh, how am I, oh, I wish I, oh, I want that car, I want that house, I want that girl. Why? I don't know. I want that. I want children. Why? I'm not saying all those things can't be part of our lives. Of course not. I'm not saying that goals shouldn't be set and met. I think that's a good thing. Orchestrated and disciplined lives are good. But keeping the main thing, the main thing, that's what I'm talking about. Following Jesus every day. How did you, David Rosales, how did you at the age of 20, coming from the background you came from, how did you remain strong? How? By following Jesus every day. By waking up and making this new day the day. And by following him sincerely. Going through tribulation, yes. Going through pain, Absolutely, who doesn't? Going through loss, everybody does. Going through sorrow and grief, going through rejection, going through people who talk about you, people lying about you. Well, why do you remain strong? Because I'm in love with Jesus Christ and he's returning and I'm going to go with him. There'll be no more tears. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more pain. There'll be no more death. All of that is not allowed in his kingdom. There'll only be joy unspeakable for eternity. And eternity matters a whole lot more than this present time. So comfort one another with these words. Look up, for the Lord is returning. And it could be at any moment. How then should we live in anticipation of being with him? Letting the other things that can distract us, let them slip away. And embracing the only things that are permanent. And the thing that is most permanent is our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So these Thessalonians are saying, we're being told that we're in the tribulation. We're going through affliction and pain. And our parents and our friends are dying. What are we going to do? And he says, look up. The Lord will descend with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and a trumpet. And you'll be gone. And then everything's left behind. And this is worth living for. This mortal will put on immortality our bodies will be instantly made suitable for heaven and therefore comfort one another with these words. We will forever be with the Lord because of our faith in him and his love for us. And so though you go through affliction, hold on because it's worth it. You will never regret leaving something behind when you see him face to face.